Welcome to the uh, presentation. I always get the best time slots, usually like something like the last day right after lunch. So hopefully I'll keep you awake. Um, so hopefully, did, did, uh, I don't know if anybody got to go see our, uh, our tech uh, presentation last night at the tech showcase, but we had some of our demos running last night. And um, through a couple of the other presentations I've attended, we've had a lot of questions about what AGL is. So hopefully here, next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'll be able to answer your questions. And if we can't, at the end, I've got some time left, I believe, for some Q&A. So, so first of all, what is automotive grade Linux? Well, we're a, basically we're a nonprofit pro open source Linux based collaborative project of the Linux Foundation. That's a mouthful. Um, focusing on rapid innovation of vehicle software. And our, our tagline is collaborating to build the car of the future through rapid innovation. And I like the, uh, in this tagline, I like the collaborating part the best. So um, as an example, I used to work for a, a Tier 1. I used to work for Continental. I used to work for Motorola Telematics as well. And uh, Tier 1s, in my experience, never collaborated. In fact, it was always dog eat dog. Uh, there's another collaborative project out there called Genevi, and we, we never saw any real collaboration between the Tier 1s. We were never incentivized. And the amazing thing about the way we've done things at, at Automotive Grade Linux is we have Tier 1s actually collaborating in real time on the same software. So for our latest release, we had, a few, it, we had a few hackathons or integration sessions in Yokohama, Japan in November and December. And we had 35 to 40 people show up at these events from I have 20 to 25 different companies. And we had tier ones like Panasonic and Aish and AW and Denso working on the same source code, sitting in the same room together getting applications to work, whether it was the navigation app or the instrument cluster or the home screen. We're seeing a lot of really good collaboration. And so it's rapid innovation. I'll show you some of the statistics on the progress that we've made. But it's also real-time collaboration between all of these competitors um, who are doing things for the greater good of the, the automotive ecosystem. So <clears throat> goals of AGL include building a single platform for the entire industry, for the entire automotive industry, that'll benefit tier ones, OEMs, and service providers, so that everybody has a, a strong base from which to start to write applications. And getting the OEMs and the tier ones to that 70 to 80% mark for developing a, a product that actually eventually ends up in a vehicle. Um, reducing fragmentation. So, we have a lot, you know, there's a lot of different open source projects out there. There's a lot of different proprietary projects out there that people have used in automotive. And there's just tons of, 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 of fragmentation all over the ecosystem. And you can see that in, even in Android which, with, it, with their uh, attempts to reduce fragmentation by having people sign agreements that backporting applications between different Android uh, versions is very difficult. So we're trying to create an, an ecosystem of developers, uh, suppliers, and experts uh, in the open source field, all to create this single unified system. So AGL is the only organization that's planning to address uh, all of the software in the vehicle. As uh, my boss, Dan Kaushi, once said at Automotive Linux Summit, if it's in the car and it's Linux, it should be AGL. So, um, we really believe that, that, that Linux, is an Linux is an appropriate operating system for all these different uh, types of vehicle systems, including infotainment, which is our primary focus now. But we've expanded, we showed demonstrations at CES of an instrument cluster in a couple different configurations, uh, telematics, connected car, uh, we're looking at functional safety, there's a lot of interest in autonomous driving and ADAS, in fact, uh, I think uh, Intel was showing an ADAS demonstration using one of the boards that we have uh, planned to add to our, our, board for, our board support system. We've had remarkable growth over the past year. Um, <clears throat> we now have over 90 members. We have 10 OEMs that are members of AGL, including all of the major J Japanese OEMs. Uh, Basically, in terms of membership growth, we had over 60% growth in 2016. 
We had, I think this morning, I approved the uh, 690th uh, subscriber to the AGL mailing list, to so the Automotive Discussions mailing list. And you'll see a lot of good technical discussions taking place on that mailing list. Um, people asking questions, people getting help, um, you know, releases being announced, patches being uh, sent. So it's a really, it's a really strong, thri thriving uh, uh, community on that mailing list, as well as other places. So the, the 10 OEMs that we have that have joined AGL include uh, all the major Japanese ones, Toyota, Honda, Subaru, Suzuki, uh, Mazda, Mitsubishi Motors, uh, Honda, and then some of the uh, non-Japanese ones include Ford, Mercedes-Benz, and Jaguar Land Rover. So we're, and we're looking to gain more traction in Europe through 2017. So we hope to see more European manufacturers join us. Ow. So this is the, uh, the eye chart of the 90 plus members that have joined AGL. Um, we have four levels of membership, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. So our platinum members are Denso, uh, Mazda, Panasonic, Renaissance, Suzuki, who just joined a couple months ago, and uh, Toyota. So we like to say that AGL is a code-first organization. And one of the main things we, we truly and honestly believe is that specs lead to fragmentation. Uh, specifications without, without code or specifications without the, uh, the, the API written and uh, uh, ap reference applications to exercise those APIs really at the end of the day lead to fragmentation. In the automotive industry, we've seen things like the most cooperative, which was intended to be a really a spec organization that defined not just a hardware or physical layer, but also fun these function catalogs that were uh, supposed to be common across the industry. And what we saw what happened with those was that the function catalogs themselves were incomplete. You couldn't actually implement a phone, for example, uh, application using the, the phone function catalog. And so all of the different manufacturers ran off and specified their own proprietary extensions to the most function catalog. And then the catalog itself didn't, because it was just a piece of paper, it didn't specify behaviors. So it didn't tell you what was supposed to happen when you invoked a, a dial command on the most ring. Um, it, it just told you, you know, invoke this and somehow uh, magically a phone call will start. So <clears throat> we found that we, as an OEM, as a tier one rather, we found that we were constantly re-implementing these standard function catalogs that were written down and we could not reuse them from manufacturer to manufacturer. So really, without code, without being code first and without having code that everybody is reusing across the ecosystem, uh, the, a spec will only just leads to fragmentation across the ecosystem. So in terms of code first, last year we had uh, a banner year, we had a record year. We, we started 18 months ago, we, we up, to, up to about 18 months ago, we were using Tizen IVI as our base distribution. And the advisory board made the decision to uh, move away from that and move towards a, an AGL specific distribution. And we call that the unified code base. It unifies the best of Tizen IVI, takes the lessons learned there, improves upon them, takes some of the Geneva components that are, that are well done, incorporates those, takes the best of standard open source components, unifies all of those, and we create an AGL distribution. So I like to, uh, this is my annual or semi-annual uh, you, could, you too can be famous slide. Um, in the past, I would list every single developer who, commit, who committed something, but we had such a great year in 2016 that I only included the top 25 committers. Um, we had a total of 1,791 commits. This is just to our master branch, doesn't include all of the release branches and the sandboxes. Um, 45 different committers last year, a total of 24 companies. And uh, you can see, we have uh, quite, a, quite a variety of different uh, companies and people committing to the, to the baseline. By company, 
Uh, I think this lists all 24 companies that contributed in one way or another. Um, but what, what's, what's hidden behind this in a couple, what's hidden behind this is that in some cases we have companies that are, um, Toyota may appear here I think only uh, four times. My glasses, I don't have my glasses on. Toyota only appears here, yeah, five times. But we know that Toyota is also financing some of these companies to do the work, do work for them. So some of these companies are doing work on their own as well as being paid by Toyota or by other tier ones or OEMs to do work for them. We also know that in like in the case of Microchip, they only had one developer on the list. We, all, we know that they, are, they have four or five developers working on um, AGL and they've just chosen to use one developer, Christian, as their proxy. So <clears throat> um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good ecosystem now of, of, of people using it. Uh, before I continue with this, the roadmap and the schedule, just one explanation. So you'll hear us, me use the term Chinook or Dab or Blowfish. So we name all of our releases after fish. It's a very, we, have a, we have a very large committee that gets together, determines the name of the next fish, that would be me. And um, so the, uh, the latest release that we did last year in 2016, we, did the, we had the Agile Albacore and Brilliant Blowfish release. And really for Blowfish, we, we really put together a lot of our processes, put together the infrastructure for doing the builds, things like that. Um, we showed through Blowfish for the next uh, six months, we did patch releases on a regular basis. I think we did our final patch release to Blowfish in January. I think we had the initial release plus five more. Um, Charming Chinook, our latest release, we released uh, in January, or end of December. Uh, we've already done one patch release to that, and we plan to continue about every six weeks doing uh, patch updates. <clears throat> And then in July of this year, we'll have Daring Dab and then Electric Eel at the end of the year. So I have to get my eel picture still. So I just put together this uh, picture of the schedule through the rest of the year. So people have questions about when, when we're doing things. As you see the roadmap, um, the we already released the 3.0 release, first, the first patch release to Charming Chinook, and we plan through the, uh, at least through the middle of the year, at least six months of support for Chinook through 3.06. Um, we're trying to be, this year, we, we, we tried last year and we were somewhat successful, but we're gonna be more uh, disciplined in our enforcement of it, of enforcing, having a release candidate one where feature development is complete and then start driving down bugs um, and getting the platform ready and having the platform ready for app developers to start developing their apps at release at the first release candidate. So we announced a few weeks ago that this would be our schedule for, for Daring Dab and Electric Eel as we go through this year. I think the, uh, <clears throat> the RC candidates here and the final release dates you see are the ones that we published and then Roughly speaking, if we go on our current uh, of about every six weeks, we'll see that kind of a schedule for the patch releases of uh, 4.0 as we go through the year. So, Charming Chinook, it's the release we just did. Uh, we released it on January 6th. We, we're Yocto-based, everything we do is based on Yocto, and we, we're trying to have a cadence of, the Yocto releases come out in April and October, I believe, and uh, following that release, will our release will follow uh, about nine months later. So, uh, Krogoth, two, Yocto 2.1 came out in April. Um, we started our, our Krogoth builds last summer and uh, basically solidified our, our Krogoth builds through the fall and released it. And the reason we, we, we chose this was we could have gone for, if we had chosen to upgrade to 2.2 in October, having a three month window between the Yocto release and our release just uh, wasn't practical. The, the BSPs weren't settled, weren't settled down enough from the, the, 
the chip suppliers. So this nine month um, iterate, this nine month lag seems to be about the right lag for us. Um, <clears throat> so we updated the Krogoth. Our AGL application framework had quite a few improvements go in. We did, a, I have a slide that shows kind of the demos that we did, but we did a large number of demos for CES and we required that everybody who wrote a, a demo application for CES, we had 12 different demo, uh, demo, sets of demo hardware with applications running on it. And we required that everybody who did a, an application use the AGL application framework and use the packaging system and the start and stop mechanisms. And as uh, Stefan from, uh, Stefan Desno from our uh, app framework development team stated at uh, either at ELC Europe or at the AMM we had, he said, well, we want everybody to use it so we can have more bugs. And <laughs> because, you know, in order to really test, like I said before, having a specification is great, but in order to test the uh, APIs and to test the implementation, you really need people using it. And you'll uncover bugs and you'll make it better. So he got his wish, he got a lot of bugs. Uh, we had basically we we completed our app our application packaging installation and uh, widget installation. Uh, you, we converted over to using System D for app control. Um, we now have a template for what we call uh, application framework service binders that people can use and create uh, service APIs. Uh, we now have an SDK for app developers, and we created a bunch of reference applications, uh, including the home screen, media player, settings, AMFM tuner, uh, HVAC, and, and a few others. So if you stopped by last night and you saw some of those applications running, those were all the reference applications that we developed for Charming Chinook and CES 2017. So, the uh, initial release was July 6th, I mean July, January 6th. The first patch update was uh, January 30th. Um, we're using the Chinook branch in our Git repositories for these, for this release, for these uh, releases. Um, we have a wiki page where you can go to and you can pull down the release notes or the, and the binaries and the source code and the links to the links to repo and Git. It's all on a single wiki page, so you can get any, pull down any one of our releases. And by the way, I already updated these, I already uploaded these slides to the um, scheduling system, so you should be able to download them from the uh, event schedule. And our next patch update is planned for March 8th, so we'll be closing the, the merge window for patches on March 1st next week, and then releasing it about a week later. Um, we rolled out a new documentation website. It's uh, docs.automotivelinux.org. Basically, uh, we're, like we said, the you know, APIs tend to be living things. Uh, build systems tend to be living things. You change, tend to change the readme files. So basically, we're pulling as much of the documentation as we can directly from our source code repos, um, from the markdown files in the source code repos and publishing them as web documents. And then any architecture documents that we developed or we develop or any requirements documents also get published to the, uh, the documentation site. So as part of that, either the source code or the other documents, we're using Git and Garrett for, uh, for version control and reviews. And in some cases, we're using GitHub instead of Garrett, but depends on the document. Um, so board support for Chinook, we had uh, we have the Renaissance Arcar 2, so the Porter board. We have the uh, Intel Minnow board Max and Turbot. Um, on this version of the slide, I forgot to I forgot to include we have the Intel Jewel board, also supported. We have a Kimu emulator that you can download and run on your run on your PC or run it as a virtual machine. Um, we have community BSPs that are basically the best effort by the AGL community. So the reference BSPs are basically supported by the, uh, the board manufacturers. Uh, this slide is actually slightly out of date. I should have included T the TI Jacinto 6, the, the value board is a reference BSP as well. It's being supported by TI. So 
So for CES, we had uh, three major announcements, including uh, that Suzuki had joined uh, as a platinum member, that Daimler joined uh, AGL as a silver member, and uh, that we released the UCB 3.0, which is what we called Charming Chinook. Um, we had 12 member demos in, our, in the AGL suite, so we had a demonstration showcase uh, suite that over 1,000 people attended. It was a bit crazy that night. Um, we had a lot of press and media interviews. So if you saw the demos that we had last night, they were basically we were showing single boards with uh, a display. What we had at the CES was, was a bit more elaborate. This, uh, this was the official AGL demo, this green one. I didn't pick the color. Um, uh, microchip, uh, this one was Panasonic's. But we had 12 demos that were very high quality, uh, showing a lot of different, all of them featuring the AGL Charming Chinook software as the baseline, all of them featuring the, the same AGL home screen and reference applications, and then adding features on top of it. So the Panasonic one was pretty cool. You could, you could actually swipe between these two screens and have applications move. And um, it was very fascinating. And again, whenever, whenever we go to one of these AGL events or we go to an event like uh, Embedded Linux Conference and we find someone's doing something with AGL, they always, they always surprise us with what they come with. So that's one of the great things about this is that we find that people are actually downloading it and using it in ways that we never really imagined. And that's the beauty of open source. You just never know what people are going to do with it. Um, so that was one of the reasons that we, we, we held this demo showcase the way we did. I put out a, a call for participation, asked anybody who had hardware they wanted to show or applications they wanted to show. Uh, we got a lot of good responses and um, showed a lot of different demos. Um, so what I wanted to do, we'll see if this works. I gotta move this. Great Linux. The goal of AGL is to build 80% <laughs> of the starting point of an infotainment platform for the car. So an infotainment platform is basically what you see in the dashboard with navigation and all of the features. At the other 20%, our goal is to have the automaker customize that in order to make it look and feel like their own brand. So behind me right now is a demonstration of the AGL Unified Codebase. This release includes several new features that we're going to be showing you in this demonstration today. First of all, I'd like to mention that our AGL platform now has a new home screen, which is new in this release, and includes a completely new uh, look and feel and uh, has uh, also a completely new application launcher underneath this, including application APIs and so on, which is new in this release. Uh, so let's start by showing the HVAC control system. So here you have a standard HVAC control system with driver and passenger side uh, temperatures. And what's really cool about this demonstration is that we're using real automotive hardware being controlled by real automotive software over a CAN bus. So Unlike demonstrations of media players and things like that, this is actually real automotive uh, uh, stuff that we're showing here. So if you change the temperature of the driver's side uh, versus the passenger's side, these uh, actuators are actually going to move based on the temperature differences. Um, and also, we also can control the fan speed. And when we uh, increase the fan speed, you'll see uh, the fan here, the airflow increase. OK, let me show you the uh, navigation feature. Um, this is simulating uh, a map and a navigation, and let me click on a destination here and start the navigation process. As you can see, we have a simulated driver here, but what's really cool about this particular release of AGL is that for the first time we're supporting dual display, and so this allows the map and the navigation information to be shown in the instrument cluster, uh, which means less distraction for the driver since it's in his line of sight uh, right there below the windshield. Next, let me show you the multimedia feature. So here we have a media player, and we'll start some music. And what's really cool about this demonstration is that we're actually playing um, this multimedia over a most ring using a most uh, device driver that is completely open source, the first ever open source most device driver in the world that is hosted by Automotive Grade Linux. 
Uh, and as you can see, we can change songs and play uh, different media all through the most ring, simulating front and rear speakers. Okay, next I'd like to show you a new feature for AGL, which is the radio application. So here we have a radio application where you can tune to a channel and start playing the audio. Uh, but what's really cool also in this uh, particular release of AGL is we added audio management and prioritization. So for example, if you go to the phone application and you make a phone call, the phone app can now take over the audio from the radio, which is a real world uh, application in terms of prioritizing audio in the car between uh, phone, radio, navigation, and anything that needs audio mixing and prioritization. So all of those features are now part of AGL as a standard and uh, application ma uh, makers can now make use of those APIs and the middleware features. Okay, next I'd like to show you the uh, vehicle information dashboard feature. Um, essentially this is a simulated uh, feature here since we're not in a ve real, real vehicle, but you can see that it shows the tire pressure, uh, the speed, um, your current uh, trip odometer, et cetera. And all of this in a real vehicle obviously would be read off the CAN bus uh, and actual figures would be shown. Again, real automotive software controlling real automotive hardware. What's really exciting about automotive grade Linux and specifically uh, this demonstration is that over two dozen companies have collaborated to this demonstration and to the AGL platform, which is uh, essentially a testament to the fact that this platform is becoming the de facto standard for the industry. Coming up in the future, in the coming year or so, we're gonna be adding several key features such as over the air upgrades, uh, integration with smartphones, uh, in including protocols like Smart Device Link. Uh, and even more exciting is that this platform will be in production in vehicles on the road, we expect, in the coming year or so. And that's really what AGL is all about. All right. Now let's see if I can start this again. Macs are supposed to make your life easier. I've tried. Okay, so I skipped a few slides here, but um, that kind of explained the different layers in more detail. Um, but they're in the they're in the deck that I uploaded. Um, so basically, we're like I said, we're using Yocto. Uh, we've had to do some extensions to the Yocto build system in order to accommodate optional features and multiple boards. So. In general, you can see that we've got a, an AGL core distribution, which is basically Meta AGL plus Meta OE um, uh, and other, other parts that come from, uh, from Yocto. We have extra features that basically are, are optional features that have been defined uh, by the developers as we go along. And we've, we have a, I'll show in a second uh, how, we, how you can enable and disable those optional features. And then we've got the demonstrator code and uh, community development. So any, the demonstrator code is basically the apps that you just saw. Uh, all the source code for those applications are available, um, <clears throat> as well as some other applications that we didn't show during the video. And then any community development would be forward-looking features that may not be 
in the build right now, but are, we're preparing for some future update. So um, pre-built binaries and uh, source tarballs are available on our website at that address. And uh, source code and build instructions are available on our wiki page. And you can also get the links to these from, our, uh, from the, re the release notes page that I showed before. Um, once, we, once you download the code and you want to get building, we had to create a, a setup script called uh, AGL Setup. We're very imaginative with our names. And um, basically to set up the proper build, the, set up the proper board you want to build for and enable the, the features that you want. So just uh, if you do a AGL setup that slash H, you can get all of the uh, build options for both the boards and the and the and the build and the optional features. But just as an example, if you were going to build the Kimu uh, AGL demo code that you just saw for your Kimu emulator, you would uh, first run that uh, AGL setup script and then do the bit bake. And uh, sometime later, hopefully not too long later, you would have a build that. Uh, that does all of that. Of course, we also provide that as a pre-built binary. So uh, more about getting involved with AGL. AGL has uh, expert groups. So we have a, a first we have a, a weekly developer call that I run on Tuesday mornings, US time, uh, Tuesday evenings, Japan time, afternoon, Europe time. Anybody's welcome to join that. Uh, the link for that's I think a little later. And then in addition to that, we have six expert groups that are really worried about requirements and architecture. And the ex expert groups meet either weekly or every other week, depending on the group. And uh, they're focused around six major areas, uh, application framework and security, graphics and UI, uh, continuous integration and test, navigation, uh, virtualization, and connectivity. So, you know, expert groups are focusing on the requirements in the architecture, and then within the dev call, we have people who are focusing on some of the individual components that may not be covered by expert groups, or uh, they're getting the code that's being specified by the expert groups into the, into the source tree. We, the first four expert groups, uh, App Framework, UI, Connectivity, and CIOT, we defined their, um, what they were doing rather broadly. We, we didn't want to form, first of all, the name expert group is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it's a carryover, I think, from some other project. But you don't need to be an expert to be in the expert group. Um, you just need to want to participate in the architecture and design. Um, I personally don't want to be an expert in anything. So um, that just takes too much time. <clears throat> So if you want to help with the architecture or you want to learn more about the architecture, the dialing into one of the expert group calls or checking out the wiki page for that group is a good way to go about it. Um, the expert groups themselves have overly, sometimes overly broad coverage of what they're doing because we didn't want to form an expert group where there were less than five to ten people who would be participating. Um, and we, so we didn't want to have expert groups just to have one just to say we had one. So once, as, as some of these uh, areas get more people interested in them and they grow uh, to, to be too big for one of these calls or one of these teams, then we split it out into a new expert group. And that's how the navigation and the virtualization teams have come about. So you can see the application framework guys are focusing on the, obviously the application framework, uh, security, software update and secure update. Um, secure boot. So some of these topics seem a little off base for that, you know, something you call app framework, but right now it's all kind of piled into one. And e each of these groups has a, uh, a roadmap that they're working towards. So the app framework team task list for this year includes, um, well, they, they, did the, uh, they did a number of improvements to the app framework. Um, and they completed the, the conversion to system D for Charming Chinook. And then based on the, uh, impl the implementation in Charming Chinook and the feedback that we got from app developers, we are working on refactoring the 
the architecture and design of both the app, some of the app framework and uh, uh, graphical rendering components this year uh, to better, to make the user, the application developer experience better and to make the applications themselves run more smoothly. So the app framework group, in, in addition to doing that kind of work, is uh, completing the, the, the implementation of C groups and namespaces, uh, doing some better, a better job or, or implementing resource management using C groups for things like memory usage, CPU usage, uh, which CPU you're allocated to, possibly network bandwidth at some point. Um, other tasks they're looking at in the, for this year, uh, identity and user management. So you, somebody comes into, the, if you have multiple people who drive the car on a regular basis and they have a set of preferences, they come into the car, they're identified, and the IVI system automatically changes. Uh, it's, it's, uh, up, it's set up so it, it's showing your preferred applications, say, or your preferred language, um, whatever else you might have. Uh, in management of, of keys during app installation, uh, first boot app, inst installing applications on first boot, uh, which actually we didn't do a very good job of in the initial go round. Uh, most of our, boot, our applications, were, all of our applications were hard coded in terms of where they are on the home screen and how they, when they get installed. So we're, we're re revamping that this year. Um, a lot of questions we get about, I have a legacy app, how do I convert that to being an AGL application? Um, so working on documentation on how to convert legacy apps. And then uh, consent management. So you have that whole user identification thing. Now, you, if you have a, so let's say you have a payment system associated with it, or maybe some geofencing or some other, some other things associated with the vehicle, um, how to ensure that uh, only the appropriate users can say make payments or can go and go to particular places. So the graphics and UI group, uh, they're looking at the compositor and layer manager, window manager, GPU interface. Um, they also got, they also have uh, other things on their. Um, Remit that are maybe outside of what you would expect, like the uh, multimedia, the media player and dis and video uh, video video player things like that. Eventually, we may split that out into a separate group. Uh, speech recognition, browser engine, all got piled into there as well. So, like I mentioned a minute ago, refactoring the home screen and splitting it out from the window, splitting out the window manager from the home screen. Uh, it's all, it was all tightly uh, put together in the current implementation uh, of the home screen that you saw. Um, we, don't, we didn't really have pop-up support, so if you have a phone call come in and you want to see a message pop up on the UI, we don't really have that implemented at this point. Um, secondary display support, you saw some of the secondary display support we have in there, but it's really difficult to manage within the current architecture, so uh, making that easier to manage. And then focus management and out of uh, how to manage applications that are not currently in focus. So we had some issues with uh, applications that had lost focus on the screen, not being able to do some things in the background. So fixing that. Instead of going through it, I put a link to the latest proposal for all of this. Um, <clears throat> it's a very lengthy one that was given by Philip uh, Arful at our, our uh, member meeting a few weeks ago. But it's, it's really, it does represent what we're, what we're focusing on for this year. So if you're interested in these topics, I highly recommend taking the time and going through Philip's uh, presentation. So uh, connectivity expert group uh, go, looks at the, the things you'd expect, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, NFC, as well as vehicle connectivity, CAN, most, LIN. Uh, smart device link to a phone, <clears throat> cloud connectivity. So we have OIC integrated already, open, uh, open IOTivity, uh, remote vehicle interactions and connected car. Uh, continuous integration and test is working on getting 
uh, are, they, they work on doing the daily builds, getting the continuous integration system, keeping it up and running. It's, it is up and running. We have daily uh, snapshot builds. We do uh, release candidates, um, make, making all that available. They're working on using Lava for device tests on real hardware, um, test environments such as uh, Fuego. It's not, we're not, we're hoping to merge back into our fork of Fuego back into uh, the main line. And um, the other main thing that we need to do this year is uh, uh, publishing our test results on a regular, I don't, on a regular basis and making sure they're readable, human readable. Um, and then adding new reference boards as we go along, as we add board support packages, make sure that those boards get built in the CI system and make sure that we do the, uh, the automated testing on those boards. So for Daring Dab, which is the release coming out in July, we've already updated to Yocto 2.2. Uh, the Morty branch, um, working on app, some of those app framework improvements that we described, um, secure signaling and notifications. So basically, the making sure we already have a, uh, a signaling architecture in there uh, for getting CAN messages and most messages into out of the off of the bus and talking to CAN and most. Uh, but basically, working on the security part of that and integrating that into our app framework. If you go to our, uh, I should have put the link in here, but if you go to our docs website, you can see the proposal, the architecture proposal that we're working towards. And then having, uh, basically making the service APIs uh, secure by adding them, adding uh, service binders to them so that we ensure that only authorized users can access the various uh, devices and APIs in the system. So uh, we're looking at adding the Renaissance RCAR 3 and the Qualcomm Snapdragon 820. Um, possibly the BeagleBone. We're getting, I've heard a lot of questions about BeagleBone and uh, it doesn't sound like it'll be that too hard for us to add, so it's something we're gonna look into. So, and then the kind of the overall goal for the year would be to get to having AGL reference applications available with uh, the back end of the AGL application framework running both Qt 5 and HTML5. Everything that you saw in the um, demos is running Qt 5.7, uh, but we've had a lot of requests from our OEMs to uh, have applications run with an HTML5 back end. So having the same level of security and the same level of uh, same app framework available for both backends. That's our overall goal, or our overarching goal for the year in terms of the app framework. And because I want to leave a little time for Q and A, um, we have a series of face-to-face -face workshops that we run uh, for both. Uh, design and require architecture design requirements where we get together and discuss you know what's what's happening next in the roadmap and and the best way to get there as well as uh, integration sessions so um, this is the upcoming schedule through the rest of this year um, and this again is post this schedule is posted on our wiki page so if you're interested in participating if you're you know you want to join AGL you're interested in participating uh, there's a lot of opportunities to meet the developers and uh, work together, both on, on the phone, through uh, IRC and the mail list, and face-to-face. Uh, in, in -face. So, Q&A. Uh, so the question was, are we addressing the economics of keeping the, the devices up to date over the life cycle 10, 15, 20 years of the car? So we, we have a software over the air update or over the air update built in using OS tree. Um, that's currently, it's currently in there. 
Um, it's one of the active features that we're working on. In terms of end-to-end -end architecture, you know, that's, that question really is, is we're providing, we want to provide the enablers so that all the pieces are there so uh, a, an OEM can then go engage with a service provider and have the pieces on their device to, to have all the pieces there. But in terms of the, the overall economics, I, that's not really something we're addressing. It's really that we're just trying to be the enablers for the, the OEMs. Snapdragon 820 is not a community board. It's, it would be a reference board. Uh, we're working with Qualcomm to get that in. They actually, the Qualcomm demo that they showed on C, at CES was using the Snapdragon 820. Um, so they have, the, they have the BSP, it works. It runs on Charming Chinook. We're just working with them now to get it upstreamed into our repositories. BeagleBone would be community supported. Application that, do we have an application to native CAN protocols? So the, the, the vehicle signaling architecture we're working on uh, is working to abstract the CAN layer or the MOST layer in a secure manner so that, so that the applications don't need to know anything about the native CAN. Now, <clears throat> Microchip in particular has been working on native CAN uh, drivers for AGL. Uh, the difficulty we have is that the CAN um, message the, the messaging and the you know the vehicle topology is all uh, proprietary for the OEMs. What we have asked, done is we have asked our OEMs in in one of our, uh, our one of our groups, our cockpit reference architecture group. We've asked our OEMs to provide a typical um, or and worst case network topology in terms of message rates and and how many devices we'd have to worry about. Um, and then we would build a simulator, a CAN simulator, using actual CAN hardware based on that uh, topology. That's something we're working on for this year. How, so the question was, what, how do we decide what board to support and what is the process for getting a board in there? Uh, so we have two levels of board. The reference boards would be uh, an OEM or a, a board vendor comes to us and says, we have a board we'd like you to add to AGL. We have a list of criteria on our wiki page. That th these are the things you need to do. You need to provide us with, with, with boards for our board farm, for our CI system. Uh, you, need to, you need to support the BSP. You need to add the BSP. We have a template for how you do that. Um, in terms of community boards, any community member can propose uh, BSP and, and post it to our Garrett. And there is a template for doing that as well. Um, and we'll work with you to get that community board into, this, into the build system. So we're pretty, we, we're trying to be just, we try to be completely open and transparent. So if somebody has something they want to do, they're welcome to go do it, come do it. Yes, it's based on the Yocto SDK uh, build system. We're working on a, a Docker container so that we, you can basically download a container and, and run your SDK in the container and eliminate all the host dependencies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer that to... Yeah, he's, he's the man. He's doing that. Uh, we're, well, we're using, the question was what graphics library is being used to interface to the GPU? Whatever the board manufacturer provides is the graphics library we're using. We're not trying to rewrite GPU drivers. We're using uh, Wayland uh, and Weston as our uh, primary uh, back end right now. And the part of, if you go look at the proposal from Philip, uh, you'll see that we are evaluating what the best, uh, what the best, we're not using X, we've, we're, we're strictly using Wayland, and what we're trying to do is evaluate which is the best Wayland implementation for AGL. Um, and that's the, one of the main topics for this year. Right now we're basically using the Qt Wayland. 
Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody.